have a long way to go. This is the true history of our world and the true human spirituality. Never before in the history of our world has there been so many distractions. People just don't know which way to turn. One guru says this, one narrative says something else. Let's give our brains a rest and let's start igniting our hearts. It is only when we start to listen to our hearts that we can understand the true nature of what it means to be human and what it means to be ourselves. And only when we understand that can we start to understand the true history of our world and our roots where we come from. Because how do we know where we're going if we don't know where we have come from in the first place? So sit back, relax, but most importantly, open your hearts, open your minds. The truth is coming out. The time of the sixth sun is dawning, the age of Albion. Are you ready? Let's go. In chapter one, we will be covering sacred water, sacred springs, Masaru Emoto, the molecular structure of water, and Victor Schauberger. In part two, we will be covering the hidden history of the world and Preston, the true ancient world, the Tartarian deception, Antiquitech, Reset Wars and the Old World Takeover. In Chapter 3, Cellular Cosmology, the Luminaries, the Stars, the Sun and the Moon and the Human Body Connection to them. Chapter 4, King Arthur and the United Realm, Hyperborea, the Arctic Mud Flood Cataclysm, King Arthur and the connection to Martin Mia Lake, the Age of Albion and the relation to the stars. Chapter 5, Atlantis, the pyramids, Viktor Grebenikov, anti-gravity technology hidden in nature. In Chapter 6, we will be covering the fake truth movement. And finally, Chapter 7, human spirituality and the connection to the divine. the sacred spring. Up until recent times, sacred springs were revered all over the world. They were protected and they were honored and the people knew the power and the sacredness of them. They made offerings to the water. They decorated them with ribbons and banners. They made prayers, they made pilgrimages. Water was seen as a great tool for cleansing the body, mind and soul and even Jesus directed a blind man to the pool of a sacred spring to have his sight restored. What if I told you that water was in fact a living being and that can be altered by emotions and vibration? Masaru Emoto already proved it. When given hate, the structure of the cymatic pattern of water is ugly, unsymmetrical and disproportionate. When given love, it can form beautiful symmetry. Thoughts and emotions affect water. And they have also been proven to affect the growth of plants. This all just proves that everything in the universe is connected through the use of vibration. All is vibration. molecular structure of water and what affects it. Now water is the most receptive of the four elements. 
Mr. Emoto thought perhaps it would respond to non-physical events. So he set up a series of studies, applied mental stimuli, and photographed it with a dark field microscope. This first picture is a picture of water from the Fujiwara Dam. And this picture is the same water after receiving a blessing from a Zen Buddhist monk. Now in this next series of pictures, Mr. Emoto printed out words, taped them to bottles of distilled water, and left them out overnight. This first photograph is a picture of the pure distilled water, just the essence of itself. These subsequent photographs, as you can see, are each different. This is the Chi of Love. And we move along here to thank you. And you can see where he taped that uh, to this bottle here. But if you read Japanese, you already knew that. <laughs> now, Mr. Emoto speaks of the thought or intent being the driving force in all of this. The science of how that actually affects the molecules is unknown, except to the water molecules, of course. And it's really fascinating when you keep in mind that 90% of our bodies are water. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? If thoughts can do that to water, Imagine what our thoughts can do to us. Could this be why the old world focused all of their buildings and so much of their time around water? Chatsworth House in the Peak District, for example, has a whole water grid surrounding it. It is based on the principle of enhancing the energy of the water. There is so much evidence to suggest that water alongside frequency, sound and vibration along with the ether can actually make free energy and a lot of these buildings were actually harnessing that free energy with the use of water, sound, vibration, frequency and ether. There is also so many examples of star forts or so-called star forts around the world. These were apparently used for defense. However, if you look closely, they resemble the cymatic patterns as Masaru Emoto suggested when looked from above. They are perfect in geometry, perfect in symmetry, and they have a lot to do with the water grid of the free energy of the old world. We see the remains of old canals and old diverted waterways all over the world. At every structure I have ever visited and that I know about are all built on the principle of water, be it a reservoir nearby, a moat, a lake, a diverted canal. Cities such as Amsterdam and Venice were man-made canal cities. And viewed from above, these are the star cities, the symmetrical cities. So the old world obviously valued water of great importance. I knew there would be something good around this path and I'm going to explore it further up in a minute. But it's absolutely beautiful all of this area and all this water network system running here and these huge rock faces at the water I don't know where it comes from but it doesn't taste like normal stream water or rain water it tastes more like pure spring water and it's coming from these rocks and here on this side this looks like a seat like a this actually he looks like he's being carved with the two armrests there and the water is just resting in there and it's actually coming from the middle of this rock 
and resting it inside here. And then if you come to this side, this water is coming from the top of the rocks, pouring down and resting into this body of beautiful, beautiful water, which tastes very similar. Although not quite this, uh, as good as where I get my water from, the spring, but it's up to different tastes of people, uh, what they like, but it's beautiful, beautiful, stunning water. And the whole area here, surrounded by rocks, is fantastic atmosphere. And I was called to this place today, just like Castle Rig. I just felt this lightness. And nature, everybody. Nature is always abundant. It's always giving. Just look at the endless supply of water coming out here. The endless supply of water coming out of the planet. When spring water was actually examined under a microscope, it displayed high vorticular motion, which is millions of vorticles spinning round, because the water is extremely energised, and tap water in comparison displayed very little of this. There is also a huge link between springs and electromagnetic energy as the sites where the springs are are extremely high in electromagnetic energy. So much that even orbs and apparitions have even been seen at the site of a sacred spring. But so many churches are built on sites of sacred springs. Why? Could it be that they are harnessing the electromagnetic energy already prevalent on these sites? It is no theory that certain sites harbour high electromagnetic energy. The old world understood ley lines, which I will talk more about later, and built structures along that line to mark out these energy lines. The cool spring water flows gently from St Bridget's Well near Kilargyr in County Leitrim. All year round, people come to this serene and tranquil place to drink the water and say a quiet prayer. Um, but it is special. It is a special place. It is the sense of peace. Um, and I like the water, the light on the water, no matter what. Oh, well, they go back very far. They really go back to pre-Christian times. See, the well was the fierce important thing to think about. Good water was the terribly important thing. So the, the well, the water that came up from the ground, they soon realised that this was the stuff to drink if you were to keep healthy and keep well. There are holy wells in every county of Ireland, on top of mountains, beside bogs and by the roadside. Some are very ornate indeed, but some quite humble, all offering a haven of silent calm. There's a long association with cures. In the past, crutches and walking sticks were left at the wells along with religious objects. I come here because it's peaceful and easy to bear here. It's quiet. So everybody, this is the Dolphin Fountain, one of many sacred springs, or at least a well where people used to get the water from the sacred spring that has been shut down deliberately by the controllers. Just look at this, beautiful. And it's criminal though, what they're doing all over Europe, if not the world. Now everybody, the spring, the actual well, the original well is behind here to the left. And here we can see here we go, look at these rocks. You see these rocks now covered in greenery there, but they are there, built around here. This is the ancient 
This is part of the ancient spring system. He's still coming out here. He's spoken to this guy. He's been coming out for the last 60, 70 years. And he would have been coming out more than that. That's just what he remembered. And this is the water. Look how clear this is. Sacred spring water. Beautiful. And here in the nearest village, there's another spring that they've stopped the flow of. And the source I know is in a field across the road, which is an absolutely gigantic spring. It actually covers the entire field. The, how saturated the ground is over there. It's actually once supplied the entire village. These types of springs, as you can see here, the spiral, this is the spiral of life again at the Old World Inn on the Sacred Springs. There's three springs in just this village and it used to supply the actual village of Penwortham that, uh, down this road. This, this, mo this road is quite new in the last 100 years. There just used to be fields here and pilgrims used to come and fill up from these springs, the St. Mary's Well and these two other wells. So these are just everywhere and it show shows how criminal these people are, these big corporate entities shutting down these springs so we can actually be fed this tap water and ozone bottled water all about making money, all about ruining our connection to the earth, all about disconnecting our, us from the elements. This is water, the primary ele one of the primary elements. The ancients in a stud that in life we have the five elements that life evolves around. Fire, water, earth, air and ether or great spirit. They respected each of the elements as sacred as they knew that the world only existed because of them. With water, they pinpointed where all the powerful sacred springs were and built rocks and small structures around them. This was done for multiple reasons. One, being so the public could have an access point to drink and collect the water. Two, being that these were literal offerings to the spirits of the spring. And three, that the energy of the stone kept the purity of the water as it came out. People have to be the ones that take the power back and to actually reintroduce them ourselves. We cannot wait for the ones higher up to do it for us. They are the ones that have ruined them in the first place. So just imagine how clean and how pure spring water is compared to what I just mentioned. There is so many mentioning, oh but spring water is loaded with bacteria. This is utter nonsense. Bacteria is the foundation of life. Our bodies are more bacteria than human cells. For those who go against bacteria, they go against life itself. Yes, spring water may have bacteria, but you have bacteria in your own body. And going back to what I was talking about elements, elements do not run out, they are unlimited forces. Fire, earth, wind and ether never run out. So why should water? Water is an unlimited resource that is being constantly produced by the earth's womb. We need to go back to basics as a human race and understand where things come from, where we come from and where everything else comes from. This is what this time now is all about, going back to basis and understanding our roots. Stone is actually one of the elements, it is part of the earth element and they understood that the connection between water and earth was very important. The cities themselves, even now, are loaded with sites of springs that in the old world were once used and honoured. Now all respect has been lost, they are being eradicated for corporate gain and to disconnect us from spirit and our true history. In the city of Preston alone, there is enough water to be used by the entire city. And the same goes for every town and city in the country. In fact, it was once this way, where water was fed from the springs to the people in pipes. 
why they really don't want us drinking pure, clean, energised water, I will explain much later in the documentary when I talk about the bigger picture. However, for now, pure spring water, out of the Earth's womb, has travelled through layers upon layers of stone and crystal over thousands of years until it finally comes out into the open air. A lot of you will be thinking that spring water is actually sold in supermarkets. However, Buxton Water, for example, has only travelled through one mile of British rock before it emerges out of the spring. This will be only a groundwater spring. True spring water is primary water, water that has never reached any part of the earth contaminated by man. This water has mineral content so much higher than standard water. Think about it one mile of British rock, or hundreds to thousands of years of rock and crystal. Bottled water is then ozoned, denatured, shoved into plastic bottles and left to stagnate. And now for the big one, tap water. Fluoride may be the kinder ingredients inside. Some of the ingredients may be too scary to mention, but I will do it anyway. Even on the front page of Google, if you type in the ingredients of tap water, it says Heavy metals, additives, chlorination byproducts, pesticides, arsenic, radon and even rocket fuel, to name a few, have been found in tap water. And this is travelling through decaying pipes. It is unbelievable. This is not to mention all of the pharmaceutical products that have been found in tap water also. In Australia, only 70 chemicals are monitored during the tap water process, but there are 300 of known concern. In the US, 140 chemicals are not even regulated. If this doesn't encourage you to wake up to where water really does come from, I really don't know what will. So, next time one of those UNICEF adverts come on, I think it's us that are wanting clean water. But going back to more of the positive side, sacred springs will never run out, they are still running. It is just up to us as humans to actually acknowledge the existence of them and to reintroduce them. There is much confusion regarding Tartaria and this is also the case in the city of Preston for example. The Tartarian narrative states that the fantastic architecture we see in our cities is from before the reset and the buildings were then redesignated into what they are currently, for example libraries, schools, courts and religious buildings and then a mainstream narrative is given. This makes sense, but what about the photographs of Tartarian architecture? that is similar all over the world being built recently. We have two options. Either the construction is genuine and they had the ability to build Tartarian advanced architecture in the late 1800s and early 1900s, or the photographs themselves have been manipulated by the controllers. But both of these theories do not make complete sense. Surely somebody has stories from the late 1800s and early 1900s that remembers or saw what happened. Did they have technology? Were they really building impossible architecture just by hand in sometimes less than three years with horse and cart below? Or were the structures already there? 
This didn't happen long ago, but still questions are swirling around in our minds, begging for answers. Why aren't we building structures of magnificence today? How did they have the consciousness to produce structures with ancient symbols and statues on at a time where the world was so caught up in fear and darkness? It makes no sense. Primitive tools just do not match with the architecture some travel from all over the world to see and crowd around. Perhaps the technology from Tartaria was brought forward, used and then phased out, but still that doesn't explain how they had the consciousness at that time to perceive such structures, at a time where horse and cart were the only means of transporting the materials. It is the same story all over the world, removing the bells, removing the antiquitech. It is very strange how it took them longer to dismantle the old town hall of Preston than it took to build it. These are the remains of the old town hall, dumped by the River Ribble. So here we have a completely intact cavity magnetron, where in the old world, these, this would have been vibrating the ions. And if you see this glass in it now, and originally wouldn't have glass in it, so the energy will be able to be manipulated through the sound and the organ that will be playing inside of the structure. And here, further down, we have this cavity magnetron with absolutely nothing in it. It's been demolished, it's been taken down and filled with glass to hide the truth. They don't want this being everywhere because it would raise suspicion. So they would ch change the designs on a lot of these structures. But this is fantastic, the symbolism all over this structure, old world symbolism. Absolutely fantastic structure here in the city of Preston. Here we have typical Tartarian architecture, but apparently built in the early 1900s. Here we have the apparent construction photographs of the Sessions House at Preston.
Here we have another old world building in the city of Preston that resembles the Greek architecture demolished. The cornerstone of this building was laid in 1877, but the date at the top of the building is older than the cornerstone date, so how does that make sense? And here it is the same throughout the world. One year to build a fantastic structure with horse and cart, primitive tools, So much of the old world antiquitech over the years has been taken down in the city of Preston and obviously throughout the world. Throughout this documentary we will be talking about so much innate truth and ancient wisdom but this is the only part of the documentary that we will have to put our hands up and say we do not quite know what happened. We are leaving it up for debate. But all we know is the controllers are making it so hard to decipher the truth surrounding the old world. The entire area around Preston is huge regarding the old world with so much lost history. The small village of Penwitham, as ordinary as it now looks, has evidence everywhere of its former glory. Not only was there at least three sacred wells, but there was once a monastery and an old priory, both destroyed. But by far the most interesting piece of lost history is the old castle, which was supposedly built here, right next to the modern day church. To me, I beg to differ. I feel as though the castle was much larger and was once connected to the so-called church itself. Just look at the drop from the modern church to the ground. The entire place was so high up, as if an old moat was once present down below. The mound itself looks much more like an old Celtic burial ground where the so-called small castle was stood. Structures were situated always right near the water. Now this was not the not for the reasons we've been told about it's because of the water and it's you know importance in the electrical grid these were the castle moats and, and things like these these were all part of the electrical grid
but the true purpose of castles along with the electrical purposes are yet to be discovered in my opinion and uh, they're not we're not being told the truth about what the castles castle structures really were all i know is that they resemble water towers churches resemble castles castles resemble cathedrals and they were all to do with the electrical grid so this one here is situated i have heard on a ley line now these are important energy parts in the in the area in the land about energy and ley lines and all of this so this permanent castle was apparently situated in one of these ley lines The narrative simply doesn't add up. I feel this was an extremely powerful place. In fact, it is said the present Lancaster Castle was Penwitham's replacement. You see, why would they replace an old wooden small castle with one huge immense one? It makes no sense. Another nearby town to Penwitham is Leyland, which is said to be situated on a ley line, hence the name. There is so much left to be discovered. But what makes it hard is the modern day junk covering up the truth. But the truth cannot be hidden forever. The land speaks to us, as the indigenous people say. The land is a living being which holds energy and knowledge of the ages. The Celts and Druids actually had no written knowledge. Instead, they placed their knowledge in the stones and landforms themselves, along with using the Oham symbolic language. If we travel further to the surrounding countryside around Preston, we have Pendle Hill, a hill so famous regarding the witches of old, prosecuted for the knowledge they held. We also have Rivington Pike and Winter Hill with its cairns and destroyed stone circle and of course Martin Mere which will be coming up later in the documentary which was England's biggest freshwater lake. Most cities are unrecognisable to what they once were in ancient times and the city of Preston or Priest Town would have been right up there with the best with its spring networks, lost medieval monastery, canal network, and who knows what else has been lost to the ages. It just goes to show how something so magnificent and sacred can be disrespected and dishonoured, transforming a place into a shadow of what it once was. What is even more important, however, is the areas around Preston, which were once huge ancient forests called the Forest of Lancashire. There were dozens of ancient forests in England, all massacred. Trees are sacred living beings and the destruction of trees, especially ancient ones, is still happening. It needs to stop. Trees are the standing people, the definition of life. We must work together to replant the forests for the next generation. We are the ones we have been waiting for.
When I visited Castle Rig Stone Circle on the vernal equinox, I was struck at how close the stones were to mirroring the mountains behind them. If there is something with these alignments of importance, it changes everything. These alignments are connected to the land itself and it shows how connected the ancient world was to the land to go through all of the trouble of matching the stones to the land. It is well documented that structures like the pyramids and Stonehenge mirror the celestial bodies. So it is highly likely that structures such as Castle Rig Stone Circle are mirroring the landforms as well as the celestial bodies. When trying to discover the truth about the land, it is so important to gain a connection to it by visiting it, by making offerings and prayers and getting to know one another. The land speaks to us, it is a living being and it gives us insights. When we actively search for the truth, the land wants us to know. When I was at Castle Rigstone Circle, I felt the energies of the stones calling me to the truth. I went around touching each stone and I received insights along the way. This is a divine connection to the land which our ancestors had and this is how we can truly get to the truth about our land and our past. The land wants us to know the truth, but it is our willingness to interact with the land that this can truly happen. When it comes to navigating through our true history, logic alone cannot get us to the place we want to go. Just like we cannot understand where we come from and who we really are logically, our history has to be felt rather than thought. When we search for historical truth, 
we firstly must acknowledge the falsity of the mainstream historical narrative. A story is what it is, a made up set of chosen lies to paint a picture of where we come from to solidify their agenda of the future. Horse and cart, crooked housing, constant wars for thousands of years, a great story with many half truths but the majority are blatant lies. To see past their narrative is step one. Now, where many go wrong is in the term advanced civilization itself. Many believe that an advanced race is advanced technology at the forefront of civilization. An advanced race in technology must be the true old world, people think, and I don't blame them. Many buildings and cities beg a belief they are truly extraordinary, worthy of an advanced race. Some of the architecture goes beyond capability of modern builders. In fact, I am going to leave you with a slideshow now of exactly what I mean. Incredible, isn't it? But there's a problem. Balance. Nature. Building after building, an out of balance civilization, just like now. The original old world would never allow that. Technology and greed over balance and harmony is what the mainstream Tartarian narrative goes off. The legend of Atlantis is clear, and I will explain later, but for now, Getting to our true history, we have to go even further than a mere advanced technological race. We need to go back to basics. Once upon a time, there lived a simple people, happy with what they had in nature. They thanked the world and loved it, as they knew it was a part of them. 
they lived in balance and harmony, where humans coexisted with the rest of the natural world and the spirit realm. Their architecture was in balance with the world. They built monuments to align with the cycles of the stars and the moon. They had a relationship with their heavens, with the divine. They understood the 2160 year cycle periods between the ages by studying the stars. This was not a technological advancement, but an advancement of the mind and the heart. They even built their stone circles to align with the land itself as well as the heavens at times. This just shows that they had an absolutely fantastic connection to the land and they understood that having a connection to the land is having a connection to yourself. Their advancement was an advancement in collective consciousness, not a technological consuming world like the races that came after, seeking to take rather than to give back, a balance is what is needed. When it came to the old world, they used a combination of frequency, sound, vibration and extracting the ether or the fifth element from the ionosphere. Every single thing in the old world structures had a purpose. For example, the cavity magnetron it would have been vibrating the ions and creating an abundance of free energy. The sound produced by instruments like the organ would have further enhanced the sound and again influenced the amount of energy created in the structures. The majority of the time, the organ was always placed directly in front of the cavity magnetron. The spires or antenna on these structures actually were pulling in the ether from the ionosphere. Every single structure regarding the old world was always in geometric precision. It is sacred geometry. Every single thing they created in these structures was perfect. There was nothing off, there was nothing wrong every single thing was made for a reason. These cavity magnetrons and resonators were found all over the structures, inside the structures, outside the structures, they are everywhere and were very important when it came to the tools of sound which they were in the old world. The columns the majority of the time also had iron bars inside and iron is extremely magnetic.
just like in our microwaves. These structures had cavity resonators all over, vibrating the ions. The iron oxide in red bricks is known to store and hold energy and this is why all of the old world buildings including the ancient ones a lot of the time had red brick involved. The old world was an electromagnetic grid. The technological spires on top of the temples and old world buildings are identical to the technological features displayed on modern day power stations. In the following clips, you will see where the energy harnessing technology has been removed from the buildings.
These structures are found in so many cities throughout the world and so many have been destroyed and the water has been stopped from coming out of these structures now. Crystals are the foundation of the earth itself. Underneath our feet is layer upon layer of crystal. Crystal can hold and store energy. It can hold ancient memory from our true history and even aid humans in illumination. Our ancient ancestors understood this. They knew how to use the magic present in crystals and knew that our pineal gland has a crystalline structure that can connect us to our higher self and the rest of the cosmos. There are so many different varieties of crystal and each crystal can help heal different parts of our bodies and our beings. They can help heal our DNA and help awaken our higher selves and even our chakras. The true natural energy harnessing star force that are in every continent all over the world have so many similarities with Masaru Emoto's experiments with water. As you can see, there is water all around these star forts. These are separate canal systems and it is fractal geometry which is visible with all the structures and everything the old world did. The sacred geometry in the old world vibrational labyrinths found in so many ancient buildings, stately homes and on the land itself had multiple functions regarding the connection to the spiritual world but also the electromagnetic grid. The Celts themselves were known for using these vibrational labyrinths, especially on their stone circles. Carvings, both in Europe and also in India. There, labyrinths found their way into the world of the Greeks and into the Romans. You find them as mosaics, particularly in Roman villas and public buildings. They found their way then into the early Christian church through manuscripts, into the floors of churches and cathedrals. And certainly by the medieval period, they'd spread as far as uh, Arctic Europe, down into North Africa, as far away as places like Java and Sumatra, and also here in America. <laughs> Many wars over the centuries were used to destroy the knowledge of the original old world. The blood spillage on the earth is not meant to happen. Men's blood is not meant to be spilt on the earth in this way. World War II and World War I were huge wars, putting the consciousness of the world in such a low vibrational state of fear. Wars against the indigenous native peoples, for example, were used to wipe out the innate knowledge that they held. You will never see the controllers fighting themselves. They make so much profit and money and power out of humanity, making them suffer for their own gain. At 
7.55 a.m., hell broke loose. Man-made hell. Bakers, quartermaster and line of communications troops picked up their rifles and fought to the If you are still under the illusion that the material society is a free world, this is exactly how they take everything from the people. the same fire narrative worldwide to make an excuse for the destruction of the old world buildings. Dresden, Germany targeted specifically during the wars to destroy all of the old world architecture that it once held. innocent people locked up in these asylums for having knowledge of the true old world. This is just a short list of the asylums set up in England alone. Imagine how many there were worldwide.
So many wars were given fake narratives. Their true purpose was to eliminate the old world and to set up the new controlled world. Mandatory schools were introduced to target the innocence of the children and indoctrinate them into this new world. The old world free energy is eradicated. The written knowledge that the old world held was destroyed and even burnt. so sad what happened, but the old world themselves wrote down prophecies. They knew that something like this could happen, but they had hope. All is coming to light, and the knowledge of the true old world is returning. The ancient world always knew to watch the stars, the planets and the skies very closely. They knew that what happens above influences what occurs below, as above, so below. They knew that 2020 would be an extremely vital year for the collective consciousness of the human race and that the years following, humans could really make the shift into a new golden age. Again, it was their advancement in their minds that allowed them to perceive this and then actually read the heavens to predict something thousands of years in advance. They also knew the sun was transitioning from its fifth period into the sixth, hence the time of the sixth sun. They watched everything so closely as they knew it was a part of them and that they too were contributed towards the future of the earth. They trusted the process. This is also why they built their structures to align with the luminaries, because the structures themselves were huge astrological clocks and sundials. Having a relationship with what went on above was absolutely massive for them, and this is why they went through so much effort to produce the structures to mathematical precision. We are slowly coming back to this knowledge as our consciousnesses evolve once again, where we will one day be producing structures once again just like the ancient world did. The outside world is a reflection, a mirror of our internal world, 
and this is true also of our architectural capabilities. As we advance, so does everything else. They would also have known how the sun, the moon and the planets and stars affected their day-to-day -day lives, and they would also have lived accordingly, matching the rhythms and ebbs and flows of the luminaries. There was time for high energy, yet time for reflecting inward. They inner stood the balance. For example, a full moon was a time for reflecting on what had been and what has been learned. And a new moon was focusing on future ambitions and goals. They made offerings and prayers. And had sacred ceremonies on the spiritual occasions, the special occasions, like the solstices, the equinoxes, and full and new moons, as well as the planetary alignments. Connection was a way of life. They used sites that had strong magnetic fields to commune with the ancestors and he did huge ceremonies. They knew that death was just a transformation of life and they actually celebrated death as a celebration of the life of the soul that had just passed. They knew that the soul would just move on, on to the next experience. It was only the physical body that had passed. When the soul of a loved one passed, they made sure to help it move easier into the other dimension, instead of halting it back with excessive grief and sadness, and as if death is only dark, like modern society says, simply because we have lost the connection to the cycle of life which our ancestors had, and again, this was because their consciousnesses were more evolved, so they could understand these things. Of course, there will be a time for mourning and grief. But afterwards the soul would be allowed to move on freely so the new time could begin.
Um, what is your theory? Well, uh, it is by now rather more than a theory. Uh, 10 or 11 years ago, I stated to various scientists that the moon is not a piece of rock, but it is a plasma, a plasma phenomenon, a cosmic plasma. called sonoluminescence. The first time I saw sonoluminescence was in a darkened room. I was transfixed to look at this uh, spherical flask of fluid. And you'd look into the center, and in the center see a, uh, a glowing blue-purple light, uh, which could be seen with the unaided eye looked like a star in the heavens. Seth Putterman called it the star in a jar, a tiny spot of bright light contained in a flask of liquid. This star in a jar is made when a sound wave is passed through a small bubble inside a flask of liquid. community because they're they're asking questions and they're you know trying to get to the answers but but the the truth of it is is there's there is no scientific evidence to break down a flat torus field there is no such thing there's no such thing as something being a flat and three-dimensional object at the same time either because a lot of them say well it's hollow but it's flat but it's round and it's this at the same time that's it's absurd I mean, how much more are you going to try and force things into your model of it being flat? It's not flat. It can't be flat. I'll explain why. When you break down the, the, these two pictures here, showing you uh, field theory, 101, this little orange, or this um, greenish looking blue disc right here, I don't know if you can see that, that bluish disc right here that's flat right there. This is where flat earthers say they live, on the flat part of a torus field, okay? So what this is right here, is this is the centripetal dielectric movement and zone, right here. Centripetal dielectric movement and zone. Centripetal means in, so everything is converging inward, and that breaks it down right here. This is your dielectric um, plate right here. This, this greenish, bluish looking flat plate right here is this yellow, right here. This is what you're seeing right here. So everything is centripetal, it's converging in on the center point. It's converging in on the center point. 
on the center point. On the center. Center. Center is the, the point of creation. Center. So everything's converging in at this center point, which is the dielectric field. It's destroying space, meaning, and this is where they say they live. So everything is sucking in. You can take your idea of a black hole, and this is exactly what you would get. You understand? So what this is, where they say they live, is in a chaotic state of a black hole, of nothingness. Nothing exists here. This is formless energy before it's cast out and expressed through magnetism. unity of Estero, Florida, conducted a survey on the Gulf Shore at Naples, Florida. This, this survey covered a period of several months, proving conclusively that the Earth curves upward and that we are living on the inner surface of a hollow globe. The sun, moon, and stars all being within the circumference of 25,000 miles. We have here a working model of the hollow globe, or the cellular cosmogony as we call it. On the inner surface of this great shell, we find here the western continent. Over there is the eastern hemisphere, and here is the sphere of the heavens with sun, moon, and stars revolving. Contrary to the usual thought 
that the China is beneath our feet. It is in reality above us. Once upon a time, there lived a man called Arthur Pendragon, or King Arthur. He united the lands and Albion to form a world of peace and beauty. From the chaos and devastation of the tyranny and abusive power of the old, Greed and power took over before Arthur, and so it was his mission to unite the realm, bringing truth, honour, principles and justice in its place. But the prophets and poets didn't lie. They knew that one day Arthur's kingdom would be in peril. But Arthur was not just a king, he was the once and future king. The poets knew this and they knew that one day there would be a time where Arthur would rise again to unite Albion forever. The time of Arthur's return is already here. If you sense it and observe, we are right in the middle of the biggest battle we have ever had, one for our minds and our souls. The rise of King Arthur and the awakening of King Arthur himself will trigger all of humanity to awaken, along with the 30 dragons ready to awaken when the consciousness of humanity is ready. And when the consciousness of humanity is ready, we will again be able to see the creatures that were there in the old world. The Unicorns The Dragons The Fairy Folk and the Griffins. The Twelve original Grail Kings, whom Arthur came after, stayed here, their souls dormant, whilst their beautiful kingdoms were taken over by greed and darkness. They couldn't exist at such a low of a vibration whilst maintaining their own high vibration. They needed to wait until the vibration of the world once again is light enough to therefore re-emerge. That final ascension is now. The eleventh dimensional rod and staff holder is Arthur, guiding the earth into awakening to restore the lost kingdom of God, bringing divine masculinity back and restoring cosmic justice. Arthur along with his beloved Excalibur sword, will defend the Holy Mother and all innocent life in this realm. He is the principle of right action. To stand up for what we know as the truth and to protect others from intentional evil. His cosmic consciousness body belongs to the Michael energy 
He is the protector of the 11th dimensional gates of Avalon. He is the cosmic being sent to Earth by the Creator to be his full expression in this world during the awakening to guide humanity into the new age. Arthur and Guinevere were not only deep lovers but were divinely connected in a spiritual marriage, serving the Christos mission on earth. They were Celts themselves and understood the truth of life. They possessed artifacts that came from the time of Atlantis. Arthur, guardian of the Cathars, hence King Arthur or Cartha, is the protector of the DNA and RNA of the human protecting the ancient DNA geometry and consciousness. The crown chakra, once open, can access this Arthurian wisdom, but the controllers are trying their hardest to prevent the chakra from opening. This is why they are waging war against our consciousnesses, against our minds, because this stops our crown chakra from opening fully. In the central UK, a dragon, King Queen Shield, is placed to unite the triple solar archetypes of Arthur, Michael, Yeshua, Guinevere, Mary Scotia and Mary Sophia. This is all held on the Bellinus Ley Line, which is the largest ley line in Britain associated with Albion. Along this Bellinus Ley Line, are multiple structures all on this line, all in line, as the ancients understood and could feel these energies. But before the structures were placed there, there were stone circles and monuments that go back to the Celtic times. But what about where Albion is truly based? I'll tell you, it is in the northwest of England. Once home to the biggest body of fresh water in the country, drained in the 18th and 19th century to make use of farmland, this lake was the Lake of Lancelot or Lancelot Sulac, where upon Arthur's death, threw Excalibur into Martin Mere Lake where the Lady of the Lake would take it to its depths until Arthur is ready to once again rise again, bringing the natural timelines to Earth and dissolving all unnatural and artificial timelines. Just like Stonehenge and other stone circles, Arthur had a memory to our true history our true roots and timelines and inner stood nature and mother earth. This is why the Celts built structures like Stonehenge that although it may have been tampered with over time, holds memory of our ancient past and also to Hyperborea. Arthur possessed the innate knowledge of the essence of life and when he embodies his creation, nothing is lost or forgotten. The divine plan will work out, and just like his solar logos, twin brother Yeshua, he is destined to make sure the divine plan unfolds and the grail is protected. His sole guardian, Merlin the Magician, a warrior of the light, alongside all the knights of the round table, will stay loyal to Arthur to make sure Albion is born. The round table and everything Arthur stands for is what holds the world in balance. Trust, respect, honour, courage, principles. These were all Arthur's core values. So all of the beings that were there in the Arthurian times are here with us now. They are embodying their truth protecting sovereignty and standing by natural law. 
What we need to do as people is come together and hold the values that they taught. We then need to teach our children and their children the same values and then the world will be unstoppable if we stick to sovereignty, integrity. What have the controllers to control when we are free sovereign human beings standing by natural law and living and breathing our truth? The time is now, look in the mirror and ask yourself, am I living my truth with courage, with honour? Before the drainage of the largest freshwater lake in England in the 17th century, Martin Mere Lake stretched as far as Rufford to the east and Churchtown to the west. The lake's northern border was in the area of Holmeswood and it extended as far south as the Scarisbrick Hall estate. The original Scarisbrick Hall estate is now demolished 
but it went as far as that, making it the biggest lake in the country. After the drainage, the area is now covered in farmland. Perhaps this was an attempt by the controllers to eradicate the true history of the place, but the energy can still be felt and the legends are very clear surrounding Martin Mir and King Arthur. The legends speak of an advanced race at the north called Hyperborea. Connected to the Arthurian legend. and the Arcturus star constellation. There is evidence of a cataclysmic event that originated at the north and spread worldwide, possibly linking to the famous historical destruction events of civilization. In the frozen earth of Siberia, remains are found of lost animal species such as the giant mammoth, wiped out by a sudden global cataclysm. Ancient maps have been discovered. of Queen Maud's land, which is now under nearly a kilometer of ice 
and its true configuration wasn't determined until 1949. Perhaps the most famous cataclysm of all time is the legend of Atlantis. It is said to be located beyond the Pillars of Hercules. Poseidon created Atlantis in the first place. and his beloved kingdom was once balanced and harmonious. In the temple of Poseidon, all of the natural laws of the land were inscribed, but once the people started going against these laws, that was where the downfall began. Inside the temple of Poseidon, featured a massive statue of the Greek god in a chariot being pulled by six winged horses. Poseidon has always been and still is the guardian of the oceans and the seas.
But once Poseidon saw that his civilization got too greedy for their own good and the kingdom full of wrongs and injustices out of balance with the natural world he drowned it under the ocean the great flood that wiped out the most technologically advanced civilization in history Wiped out in just 24 hours, according to legend, caused by the wrath of Poseidon, the god of the seas and oceans. The legends speak of one terrible night of fire and earthquakes. That caused Atlantis to sink into the sea. Could this be the great flood that all the tribes and religious texts speak of? It matches well enough, but are people in a standing the significance? It is staring us right in the face. Just because a civilization can become advanced technologically and have all the power and artifacts in the world, it means nothing to the creator. The Creator desires peace, harmony, balance and cooperation with the natural world. Not a race that was so caught up in their arrogance narcissistic ways that they started to pit themselves against each other and nature so the gods wouldn't have it and sent a clear warning of what would happen if we ever fall out of balance with our mother and the reason why something like this has not happened in our days I will explain later but it is one word, faith, faith in humanity. The pyramids are encoding the reset dates of our realm. After the destruction of Atlantis, the survivors spread out all over the world.
and built the pyramids encoding the knowledge of the 26,160 year reset so the future generation could access this knowledge. Each star moves one degree every 72 years. And it takes 26,000 for a star to complete a full cycle. The four angles of the Pyramid of Giza refer to the four signs of the zodiac of Taurus, Leo, Scorpio and Aquarius. The four main stars belonging to these signs are the four guardians of heaven, Aldebaran in the Taurus constellation, Regulus in Leo, Antares in Scorpio, and formal hout that was once in Aquarius but now in Pisces. These stars keep the same position in relation to each other. Leo and Aquarius are the Sphinx and the Scorpio Taurus Eagle Axis is shown as a winged bull by the Babylonians. The symbolism of these constellations is encoded on so many old buildings. The Pyramid of Giza is an astronomical clock. The Sphinx's head marks the completion of a cycle every 26,000 years.
It's a man named Grabenikov from Russia. Uh, Grabenikov was kind of a uh, non-conventional scientist. He was an entomologist, did a lot of work with, uh, you know, bugs, entomology. And his favorite thing was to go out into the steppes of Russia and into the various outer hinterlands and camp out in the summers and uh, study his favorite subject. And on one of these expeditions, uh, he started seeing some weird effects. Uh, show that there was a, he found a certain bug that didn't fly, it levitated. And this was, uh, he'd, he'd put this bug in, into a little uh, vial or something, and he saw this vial jumping up off the lab table, jumping up and down. And of course, this is patently impossible based on any time of normal physics. So he got into this, and he found out that the, the bug wings themselves uh, were creating an anti-gravity phenomenon under certain conditions. So I, I think I found the bug, actually, actually a beetle. And if you analyze this bug structure, you see a hexagonal pyramid structure array throughout the entire bottom wing of this bug. And uh, anyway, he took a whole bunch of these bug wings and he glued them to like a Venetia blind structure and he put it into, into a little platform he built. So they, they were all, it, these bug wings were all covered in here. And he used the, uh, I theorize he used the wing covers as well as the inner wing itself. There's also a kind of a handlebar on this thing uh, with some controls. You can see the thing a little better here in detail. Uh, the controls, I think, had to be manipulated continuously and probably vibrated to create the same action that the bug was doing. There was also down at the base some kind of a lever, which I suspect controlled the amount of uh, lift he was getting out of this thing. Anyway, Grabenikov claimed that he could fly this thing or levitate it, and it would go around at a thousand, almost a thousand miles an hour. He said that there there was an energy field that built up around this thing due to this, and by uh, this thing building up, it built out a force field that basically surrounded him and protected him from the local environment. This is the platform with him on it, about three to six feet above the ground, because here's the shadow here down below. Throughout the years, there have been many people trying to expose the truth and hidden deceptions. And since the year 2020, the world has turned into an age of information. The problem is, everybody is given a different narrative and distractions are around every corner. The channels on YouTube that are focusing purely on the negative are not being taken down, whereas the channels giving you back the power are being suppressed, banned and censored. There are ones trying to expose the lies with a pure heart. There are ones hired to give a half-truth, appearing in the media with many followers, attempting to distract humanity from the direct truth, and of course, the mainstream liars. We must learn to identify the truth without being led astray. The truth we can feel with our senses, with our beings. Our intuition tells us yes or no. When we are in stillness and not clouded by the intellect, the answers are shown. The ones distracting us are putting your attention, your power, on the narrative the controllers want. They never give an answer. They never focus on the correct timeline and vision. Instead, it is like a collective meditation, focusing on the vision the controllers want. We need to focus on the vision we want to create, hence why we are doing this documentary out of a pure heart.
There is an ancient prophecy that when the eagle and the condor fly together, peace will reign on earth forever. When the whispers from the earth become loud enough, we will no longer be able to ignore the shift. Light is creeping in between the cracks, exposing the illusions and destroying anything that is not the complete truth. What was once hidden will be shown. What was once not even in our perception, our senses, floods in as our heart opens wide. Soon you will see, as the sun shines its golden rays, whilst the children play. And run across the meadow. chasing the butterflies into the horizon, that the prophecies were correct. The ones with an open heart will see the world shift before their eyes. They will look up at a cloudless sky and see an eagle and a condor flying high into the great gates of heaven, heaven on earth. That day will beckon the time of the sixth sun. Nature and all its wisdom will fill our veins showing us the interconnectedness between all things. Mother Earth is the greatest guru, a guru that is within us all, all is connected, all has spirit. The bird wouldn't be without the worm, the worm wouldn't be without the soil. Leave a patch of land to itself and it will grow into a self-sustaining ecosystem, showing us the true intelligence of the natural world. we share also. We are a part of her. We are all God.
There is a high magic that exists in every living being, every cell, every leaf, every star. This magic can never be perceived with the intellect, never. It can only be accessed through an open heart. It is only when we connect to this that the eagle and the condor prophecies can come true. To be grounded in nature and to our bodies is the true spirituality. We are spiritual beings that are having a human experience. Our aim is to be as authentically us as possible. It is only with our cooperation that the prophecy can come true. must step into the correct timeline. The path of the heart is illuminated in front of us like a golden ray coming down from a setting sun. Follow it. Follow it and believe. Believe in who you are. Believe in what will be. The planet has been waiting patiently for us to finally come to terms with what the indigenous natives knew all along, that we are all related. Atlantis was wiped out for falling out of balance with nature. The earth saw that for it to regain harmony, it must start afresh. Our world has become dangerously close to another Atlantis. However, this time, the Earth sees hope in us. And as more and more awaken each and every day, the Earth gets lighter and lighter, and slowly, slowly, the world heals. We heal, 
And as we feel that connection to who we truly are, we then feel that sacred connection to Mother Earth and Great Spirit. Every being on Earth senses at some level the single biggest collective shift ever and it is truly a blessing to be alive, truly alive. It is no coincidence that this time has been prophesied by so many ancient cultures. The return of Christ, the return of King Arthur, the Golden Age, the Sixth Sun, the Eagle and Condor. They are all the same thing. What they truly mean is coming home, coming home to our mother and coming home to ourselves.